Hi, this is the fellow passenger. In this video, I have the great honor to speak to Jacha, an amazing musician that I came across a few weeks ago when I co-organized the electronic music open mic event in Colchester, not far from here. It's like what one of my fellow organizers said. When Jaja played, it was as if a blanket was removed from the PA system. It just sounded so clear and crisp. Amazing sound design. I spoke to Jaja after his set and found out that he is involved with Glitch.Cool. If you haven't come across them, I'll put a link in the description. You might have heard of artists like Wolg, who's active there. Um, and what you're hearing now and seeing is, um, is Jaja's music. He's got some help to do the visuals. And in this interview, we will get some insights into how he's making this stuff. I would also like to take the opportunity to highlight clip. It is something that Jaja is mentioning in passing. A fantastic opportunity for young people to get a chance to get hands-on making electronic music also with hardware. I'll put the link in the description so if you happen to be in this part of the UK you should definitely check it out. So without further ado let's dive into Jaha's world. Jaha? Is that a good way of saying it? Please yeah, say, Jaha. It, say it much better than I do. Jaha. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Pleasure to chat to you today. And thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do so. Just having a bit of a relaxed conversation. I will put some link in the description, I hope, with some of his music, because it's really worth listening to. Super high level production, in my view. I just wish I could do the stuff that you can. So I'm just wondering if we just sort of jump into it because the I saw you live uh, the other week, and I think you were working in Ableton. Is that right? Is that your tool? Was, yeah. Sorry. Is that your tool of preference, Ableton? Uh, uh, it is, yeah. I sometimes dip into FL to use a bunch of their um, really amazing plugins that they have built into the software. Um, but yes, mostly I do everything in Ableton. I, Fruity Loops, I have never ever used it in my whole life. I highly recommend it. It's a very good software. <laughs> Because it's a, it sort of looks chaotic to me, but I, I think oh yeah, it, very. <laughs> it's the workflow quite different. I remember someone was saying that because the default BPM is one hundred and forty in Fruity Loops, that's why. Is is that true? Is it one hundred and forty the default BPM? And there's so much music. No idea. One hundred and forty. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. But like, how would you say? Like, what what is it about Fruity Loops that? Uh, that you like. Oh, like, the default BPM seems to be 130. Sorry. Oh, I think 130. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. <laughs> I uh, mean, I don't know. I don't see why that would be an issue, person. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't think it's an issue. I think it was just yeah. that it was reflected in a lot of music released by... Oh, I see. Okay. Used, uh, ...that people who use Fruity Loops, that that is like mm. a, a reflection of that, whereas a lot of other mm. doors are 120. So Fruity Loop okay. producers make faster music. <laughs> I don't know if that... Okay. But otherwise, what would you say, uh, because I don't know Fruity Loops at all, like, are there any particular things that you feel like? You, you said you mentioned plugins that you liked. Yeah, so I don't know it very well either. Um, the only thing I really use it for is loading things into a plugin they have called Edison, which is effectively just a sample player. Okay. Uh, they also have SliceX, which is a very good beat slicer, so so you just load a load of um, audio in and it automatically chops it, or you can add individual chops. So if you have a long session of sound design, you can select your favorite bits and turn it into a drum kit very easily. And I quite like doing that. I was just wondering about the, so you mentioned like the sample slicing and mm. 
I'm just reflecting on my own sample playback experience. Mm -hmm. And I just tend to use either sampler or simpler in Ableton. Mm -hmm. uh, I got two samplers in Eurorack format, which are very inferior compared to the ones in Ableton. I've used some other hardware samplers in the past, but would you say that the Fruity Loop ones do something very different from the ones in Ableton? Or is it more a workflow thing? Or does it actually have functionality that's different? It has a couple of functionalities which are very specific use case, which I think are fantastic. With one of them is that you can export all of the individual slices as samples. Oh. So you can just select a button and suddenly all of these individual hits that you've made in your drum kit are now individual audio files, which is great for sample pack uses or uh, just general sound design and, and sample like library arrangement because I have a huge amount of sound design of my own and I keep it all in a big library and that's a very useful thing to me. The general things that I prefer about SliceX are just quality of life. So I don't really use it much, but whenever I'm in FL and I need to chop up a big audio file, I tend to just use SliceX. Um, there's, there's only a few specific plugins that I think are exceptionally unique to the door, and that is Vocodex, its default granular synthesizer, and um, Harma. Harma is just an incredibly powerful synthesizer, and I don't really know what to compare it to. Uh, I haven't used it much. I don't know nearly enough about it, but I've seen a lot of in incredible things made with it. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really like using FL, <laughs> just sort of mainly just for sound design purposes. Like that's the only thing I don't uh, make... and then you put it together in Ableton afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The main gripe I have with FL is its arrangement view and the multiple floating window windows. I find it easy to lose track of things in the door, but other than that, I think it's great. Um, yeah, the main reason I, I, I stick with Ableton is just because everything's a lot more concise and easier to understand, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Ableton has plenty of issues on its own. There's a lot of things I dislike about the door, especially stability. It can crash incredibly easily, and that gets very annoying. But uh, there are plenty of things about it that, that will keep me there, namely Max for Live and its, like... Um, parallel sort of processing and, and rack system. I, I really like that. But th then actually, uh, talking about Ableton crashing, because Ableton mm. is certainly my weapon of choice too, um, it is the Granulator 3 that causes Ableton to crash the most for me. I don't know if you've used it, Granulator 3. I, I, I'm i only on Live 11. I don't have oh, 12. Okay. Um, for me, it can be anything. Um, just I have a bunch of plugins that seem to just make it crash sometimes for no reason, including uh, Vital, which is a very good um, sort of wavetable and normal synthesizer and effect system. And sometimes I will move Macro One and it will crash <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> and I, should, I don't, I don't really understand it, but it just does this sometimes. It's just quite an unstable software, I think. Do you use do you use other stuff as well? Do you use hardware? Do you have any background in using hardware? Or are you in the box generally when you work? When I work, I am pretty much entirely in the box. Um, a few years ago when I started up just using um, GarageBand, I would sometimes record the piano that we have here, though this big brown box in the background, though um, it's very out of tune now and I haven't touched it in a while. Um, I have a hardware synth that I've played with a few times, but I've never actually used it in any of my music just because I haven't really been able to create, create anything with it that I find is more interesting than anything I've managed to make make digitally. Um, and uh, I have a 
a bit of a background in hardware with Clip, um, a the music organization in Colchester. Uh, I've used plenty of hardware there. Uh, while I was in uni, I was using a lot of hardware, but I, I've never really used it much in in my own work. Ah, oh, but actually, that's that's a good segue into so uni when you studied. Did you study music or sound design or something similar? I I did. I studied um, electronic music. Oh wow! Where was that? Uh, I was doing it on a what they call a hybrid course, which means I was doing a lot of the theory stuff home, but whenever I had to go and do like practical things, I would travel up to Amsterdam to. Um, Amsterdam. The main things that I learned in uni were just like um, practical knowledge about like mixing and mastering, which was not really what we were being taught. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh well, it's, it's fine. I think it's like, but you probably, but you probably learned something from that anyway. As in, oh yeah, no, I, I did. I learned a lot, but probably, it wasn't you probably what we were looking somewhere for. else. <laughs> But but so so what would you say like if if uni wasn't like the greatest source of learning for you, mm. where where would you say you got you get where have is it literally YouTube and friends or anything YouTube, like that? Friends just talking to like other people who are making things, I think is the best way to learn anything. Um particularly if you're focused like with a solely creative purpose. If you're looking to learn things um, to follow it as like a job to, you know, live off of it, I think going to something like a university could potentially be beneficial because you can learn, you know, other things and there's there's a much more widespread um, sort of education. But in terms of the most important things that I've learned, I've learned it just from people I've met uh, in person, online, and just from the internet. It's a really great tool. <laughs> How did that journey look? Where because the I would say the the set that I heard you play the other day was very ambient. Mm. Mm. Uh, but how how did your sort of music journey like, was music in your family when you grew up or or like how, how did that journey look? Not really. I mean, my parents, well, my mom um, played instruments when she was younger, um, and my dad is an avid music listener. But neither of them really had any experience making or performing or playing music. I think I just was interested in it at a, at a young age. And uh, my mum sort of picked up on that, put me in a couple of like uh, local choirs and things, and it sort of spiraled from there. And now I'm in my room all day making music on my little laptop. <laughs> how, did you, how, how, how did you get into this sort of electronic thing? Like when, when did that start? Um, with a lot of things, it started during COVID um, because uh, I, at the time, was interested in music solely as a hobby. Um, I just, like back in 2019, I sort of realized that I really, really enjoyed making music, but I didn't really think anything of it. I just sort of would open, again, Garage Band, um, which personally I think is an atrocious software. <laughs> and I would just make little bits of audio which were irrefutably terrible uh and then during lockdown i was talking with a couple of my friends that i made in clip online and eventually i started talking with other people in other online spaces and during that time i came across uh, glitch.cool which is uh you've heard of them but they're a really um incredible sort of online community uh that focuses on glitch art and music um more specifically on music but the whole visual medium and so on it, it, it continues into that and um that was where i sort of 
found that kind of music sort of for the first time. Like I'd I'd heard I'd heard glitch things in music before, but I'd never really heard music that focused so much on it. And there were a couple of places there, so I met a bunch of people that would just share music with me, and I sort of got really into that music. And then there was a online music festival run by a record label called Upscale, and Glitch.Cool had a um, a performance on that set list, and so did an artist called Woolg. And it was sort of at that point where I decided, okay, I really, really enjoy this. I'm going to spend more time doing it. And uh, I ended up going to sixth form to study music and sort of that interest developed there. And um, yeah, uh, eventually I, I ended up sort of just talking to lots and lots of other people online. And um, yeah, it just sort of developed from there. I'm sure you must have then found Wolg's um YouTube channel. I've certainly learned a lot from it and got super mm -hmm. inspired. I'll put a link in the description of this video for anyone who hasn't. Yeah. But I think if I highly helps, recommend the uh Zero to Hero uh glitch drums uh video. That is probably the penultimate Wilk tutorial. Is, is that the one where he changes the tempo and does stuff to make Yeah, uh, he yeah, uses yeah, like the uh, the stuff. BPM warping as a yeah. as a sampler. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, I've done a couple of lessons with him. Well, not a couple, I've done a bunch of lessons with him. Oh, so I'm also yeah, one-to-one -one lessons. I've done a few of those. Uh, I've done. Uh, I'm also in his Patreon. I highly recommend you sign up to that. If you have, you can get a bunch of sample packs and unreleased stuff. But if you have Ableton, uh, you can also get his big collection of Max for Life devices, and I am using those pretty much every day. They are a huge part of my workflow and some very, very, very incredible tools. There's also just a lot of really cool people in the server where he, the Discord server where he sort of uploads everything and it's 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 quite a fun community. Gosh, I really need to engage more with that particular Discord server. I'm, I'm on there, but I, I mm. just, too many things to look at. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then I, I can certainly hear, like when I've heard your music, I can hear the references, but something... Yeah, I'm, I'm very influenced by his music along with a bunch of other artists, but him, and, him in particular, he... Um, I was doing a bunch of lessons while making um, the uh, uh, Unreason Empty Space album. I was working on that. Um, a couple of those tracks were sort of started in lessons with him. Oh, wow. So, yeah, the, the inspiration on, on that sort of area of my music is, is very kind of blatant. <laughs> So there is something in your music, also in his music, and some other artists. You put some mm. in the description. Uh, we were messaging a bit earlier today. I find it mm. really difficult to put my finger on it and explaining it, but I'm going to try. So okay. there is one thing that I struggle with, um, and that is the whatever we call them, tonal elements, but they're not necessarily melodies. It's like the sort of background mm. ambience that seems to be prominent, but it's not in your face. Uh, and I can never get it right. And you mentioned something, and I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on that. That's the, you said like, when you do the layering, you have to do it sort of very quiet layers when you- Oh yeah. Up. But I also, can- I will see if I can give like a more direct sort of explanation of what I mean with like opening yeah, up Ableton and show. There it is. Okay. So if, whereas like my, if we're going to talk uh, specifically about ambient things, I have a, oh, that's a big file. Okay. There we go. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. So I have a couple of um, neat ambient sessions here. And I think, so this is, this is not like a explicit thing for um, ambience, but you, you can do this with anything. Um, but here is. Where do these sounds come from? Have you made these? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is some 
Uh, these are specifically, um, if we go around, so this is all my sample library. Um, if we go here, these are a bunch of neat sort of melodic sounds that I made very recently. And I've put them through, I've put them through a plugin called, um, called Paul X Stretch. Uh, it's free. Uh, the idea is that you just drag like a sound in here and it just stretches it. Oh, it's where you can just like switch it out like a thousand times or something. Exactly. Yeah, it's just an instant ambience plugin. And so this sound right here is just. Do you mind pulling up an EQ? I just want to see like what does that like? Uh, what what's going on? Oh uh, yeah, sure. So it, it it's very dependent on the um, input, but this is very focused in the mids, and because it's doing a bunch of things, it adds like subhuman hearing frequencies. So I'm just gonna add this. But yeah. These sounds are very mid focused, but if I grab like something that has, I don't know, let's see. Uh, go to sure. And then if I get. Love it, a darling pool is here. Oops. Oh yeah, I don't know if I get an EQ. You can see it's much more low end because the input sound has a lot of low end. Oh. So yeah, and here's the uh So would you sound. in a way you just like almost take any sample and just like mash it through this? I don't do it that often, but you you can, yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is the Input sound. Okay. So yeah, you can. You can put anything through it and you'll just get some very lovely sort of blurred ambience. I haven't done it in a while, but it worked well with this. So yeah, another thing that I often do is just getting like a reverb on let's go. You generally use the the hybrid reverb or do you use, I don't know, like Valhalla or anything like that? I'm not the biggest fan of Valhalla. I use Hybrid Reverb specifically for its um, algorithms, by the looks of it. Yeah, the uh, there's the Ableton Studio mids that I really like. Um, yeah. Wait, that's the wrong one. There we go. I just really like this reverb. Um, but so if we want to just use this as a, why is it doing? What's that? This is Imagero Piano. Uh, it's a, it's a um, sample based, just MIDI instrument, um, oh. bit like uh, Labs. Oh yeah, yeah, by Spitfire. Yeah, uh, it's same thing, it's just, very lovely and very cheap and very good. Um, but yeah, if we take this and just yeah go to hybrid reverb, turn the algorithm up, decay. There's also a neat trick that uh, Rob Clouth showed me once, where if we get um, if we if we just get white noise, just a burst of white noise. So in this case, it's just, this is sampled directly from one of his songs that just has white noise in the intro. Just, you know, slow burst of white noise. We can just turn anything into, you sorry? Put, you put the white noise as the... As the impulse response, yeah. Because the white noise covers every single frequency range. So if you put 
something of any frequency range, it will blur it because you've got the somewhat slow attack and the long release. It will turn a piano into, wait, yeah, okay. So when we're using the blend, this is the algorithm. Yeah. This is exclusively this. And because I have the dry wet up, so. Yeah, so now it's only cold. Dry, and now. So yeah, you can sort of turn anything into a pad. Turn up the decay and you'll make it last forever. But then do you do, like, oh, oh, when you make sounds... Sorry? When you make these sort of sounds that you run as a, as a sort of a texture in the background, like how do you, how do you sort of EQ that so it sort of sits nicely? Oh. It's, 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 to me, it feels like it's almost like injecting oxygen into it. Like it sort of sits there without being in the way. It's just like... So if I just um, sort of resample channel so we can just get the audio from this. Um, the best way I've found to sort of... Oops. <laughs> the best way I've found to just do that is um, just getting rid of the lows is the first thing that you want to do with any sort of just background ambience that you have. Where do you cut that to? Like that, that, uh, it's uh, sort uh, of a, a base. Yeah, so up around 100 hertz is where you want to just delete everything below that. With, with background sounds, that's the safe frequency for me, but the general case, it's just like I could put it up to here and you can still hear the harmonics. Just any frequency range where you're not, because we're looking for tonality in this. Um, so we want to just EQ it to any range where we're not going to lose those fundamentals. So I'll see how far I can push it. I mean, you know, I could go all the way up here, but it's very quiet now, and then I can always just crank the gain. And Do you have a general rule that you want that sort of ambience to peak at minus whatever dB? Do you have any sort of things like that that you do? Compared not really. Not, no, no. Um, I can try and show an example where, like a, an example of a recent track where I'm actually sort of doing this, and that would probably be better rather than building it all right now. Okay, so this is the thing that I sent you before we called. So if I just sew all of this. So this is just... Wait, I'll just play the whole thing, sorry. <laughs> What's the orange layer? The orange, this one. Yeah. Um, when you, sorry, I'm just sort of jumping back and forth. When you make them, huh? you're sort of careful to make them in a particular key so you know that they're going to fit together. So this song is 
I think in C minor because I had this chord progression that I did and it sounded like this. And my friend and I, who my friend who's much better at music theory than I am, uh, and I, yeah, we figured out that it was in C minor. So, yeah, I did a little audio jam with uh, this big sort of piano sound design session that I did, and. Uh, So it's all in C minor. Um, that's where those sounds from earlier came from. And then after the fact, it's just arranging these sounds. You can see there's fades and cuts and so on to make certain parts fit together. So have you and put, I have you put an EQ on each? Each? No, not on all of them. On um, all of the well, no, that's not entirely true. On most of them, I have the low cut, just deleting everything uh, below the main frequency range. But this one's got some low frequencies that I wanted to keep. Actually, there you go. That's better. Um, this one, whoops, a yeah, little bit below 100 hertz. This one also below 100 hertz. These are all, yeah, like there's not particularly any sort of specifics with these. I do definitely need to go through and EQ them because there's a bunch of like hard resonances. Though this one does have some automation. This has um like it slowly opens up. Because this is just the same sound throughout, like if I turn it off. It's just the same sound over and over again. But I'm slowly opening it up because starts off very quiet in this ambience and then it you can now hear it pulsing in the back you do, uh, uh, do you do anything to spread it out in the stereo spectrum or anything like that because they sound yes. quite wide nice and lush no i've done some stereo spreading on this with a plugin called sidewinder side widener uh like here Got a few different algorithms, bit of a weird, I, I don't really touch this dial much because it's a really strange EQ boost that I don't really understand. Um, but it's basically just a mono compatible um, stereo widener because usually what happens with some stereo widening plugins is they'll just delay the other so side of the stereo. The and so when you sum that, when you sum that into mono, it just sort of gets really phasey and uh, not fun. Um, but this seems to just work fine, so I just have that one. The, there's the, in terms of like EQ and things, there's really nothing specific. Like with this one, I have a, a high cut because, okay, I don't have enough of a high cut. Um, do you ever put anything on the master or do you leave that intact? Uh, I leave it pretty intact. I just have a uh, like a limiter and a clipper on there, and I just sort of grouped it to add some control to it. That's it. I mean, like, here, I'll just delete this and put anything on it. Um, no, let's grab, sure, we'll grab an OTT because that sounds fun. Uh, yeah, that's all right. And then just grab. What's that's with an A? Page at the beginning. What does what's that different to the? Oh, this is a preset that my friend made when we were working on a track together, and it's just I'll just grab a normal OTT. It's just an OTT with uh, the amount turned down to about twenty seven percent, and then the output boosted by ninety dB, I think, something like oh, that. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, right. And it just sounds fine. I don't know. There's, there's not really anything in particular you can do. You can just like delete this and just put a clip on it, and it will still sound fine. Um, it, it really depends what style you're going for. With the music that I make, I'm usually not that worried 
worried about being as loud as possible all of the time. So this is not going to be relevant to anyone that is interested in doing that. When you are doing that, I'd recommend mainly just multiband compression is your friend, but you probably don't want that on the master. You want to just be really careful with using that throughout your track. Uh, I think this isn't the best example of that. So, I don't, with my workflow, I tend to do a lot of processing and creating the sounds, but then when it comes to the actual arrangement, there's not really much going on. Um, like I can show you the instrument rack that has, you know, that made these sounds and you'll, you'll see what I mean. But um, you make more like, um, this is very ambient. Do you do the sort of, and that's what I heard when you were playing live as well, but do you do that more vogue sort of glitch, much more sort of yes. aggressive sounding as well? I haven't done it in a while just because I've had some issues making music lately but yes i do a lot of that in my sound design this is just the first thing that i've made in a while oh dear ableton is having a problem um <laughs> this is what i mean by the software yeah. is kind of unstable <laughs> uh it's thinking about it okay so while ableton is thinking anyway, sorry <laughs> it's all right while ableton is thinking about it or is it done mm. no no <laughs> Um, what's your sort of process? Like, how do you work on several tracks at the same time, or do you? Uh... Yes. <laughs> okay. um, I'm very bad at finishing things. I used to be really good at starting things, so I would have like a lot of tracks that I was just making and playing with constantly, but never finishing. Uh, I haven't really been good at starting anything lately, so I've finished a couple of things, but none of them really go together. I'm in to, to sort of answer the question more thoroughly. Um, I'm not very good at like working on things one at a time. I'm not good at sitting and focusing on one track for like a month or something because I just get bored of it and want to do something else. So. But yeah, just, I'm usually working on multiple things. You spend a lot of time because I tend to, I need to work really fast, probably for mm. a similar reason. Like if I'm going to finish something, I just, I, I can't sit and sort of finicky go through, you know, like an insane detail. Well, uh, that's my problem. I, I, I can't not do that. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm, I'm very bad at working quickly. Okay. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to get better at it, but um, yeah, when I, when I'm working on things, they usually take a long time. Oh, there he is. Ableton's done thinking. All anyway, right. Um, yeah, when I'm working on things, it usually takes a long time. Okay. Why is there noise? Okay, no noise. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, uh, just when I'm working on things, it usually takes a while. Uh, but yeah, this is the um, fun instrument rack that is the source of all of these things. Sorry to derail it. Just uh, no, 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 it's cool. It's fine. Oops. So what I did specifically, because my MIDI keyboard is broken, so I only have my typing keyboard as a MIDI controller, I just grabbed the uh, random MIDI device from just stock Ableton, and then I grabbed the scale device. Wait, no, I grabbed the scale minor device. And because the track's in C minor, I just left it as it is, and then I just... Just sort of recorded, and um, here is... I'm not going to do that right now, but... Um, if you open the chain, mm -hmm. or, or are you playing all those instruments at the same time, or do you have a sort of a chain? Oh, yeah. No, it's a, a bunch of uh, Imagero. There's... Uh, oh, hello. There's uh, uh, Imagero, 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 Imagero. Uh, and then Lost Tech. No, not Lost Tech, Piano Tech. I Imagero, that was the piano thing that you showed us earlier. Yeah. And then there's this thing called Piano Tech, which is a uh, very powerful um, modal synthesizer. 
um, which just synthesizes the sounds of all sorts of other instruments. And I just have the free trial. Excuse the flashing. It's doing this rack makes it kind of buggy. Um, I'm just using the free trial. And, and uh, so here I have the Celeste, which I am processing. If I turn this off. Oh, yeah. I'm also like randomizing everything oh, I possibly yeah, yeah, can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but. So yeah, and then I have this big rack of um, uh, a plugin called Lagrange, which is a free granular delay. And I'm just also randomizing everything, but it gets quite fun when you have like two of them with everything being randomized. And then I have this Max device called Crack Cassette, which is just applying like a tape distortion. Um, but yeah, it sounds like this with all of the processing. And yeah, it's just uh, quite delusional. Um, and each of these has that. But would your workflow be a bit like this, where you create a rack like this to create the source material that you then mm. use to? That is largely how I work, yeah. Um, in terms of when it comes to making the music, uh, it's usually a lot of sample arrangement. There's often a lot of processing that happens, but I am a, sorry, a big fan of just right clicking, freeze flatten, and then just letting it render in audio. Because um, if I don't, I end up with this permanently. Like this is currently using 60% of my oh, CPU yeah. idle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if I don't do that, every single one of my project files will just do that. Yeah. And so once I've rendered everything and done all of my arrangement, it returns to a much more palatable. Why is it struggling after I've closed the channel? Okay. Um, Maybe it just needs to cool down a bit. It's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can see it's back down to 1%. So yeah, this is usable now. <laughs> so, like, okay. So, Moving on to um, another thing, I was thinking about like um, your your references. So we talked about uh, the glitch dot cool gang, but if mm -hmm. you would want to, anyone who's watching now, if you want to recommend recommend some, what would you? What are you listening to at the moment? What do you like listening to? I'm listening to far too much music at the moment, and a lot of it's not very relevant to this kind of music. But if I had uh, any recommendations for like this sort of stuff, and I have a lot, I will send them to you in links afterwards so you can put them in the description. Um, I'd highly recommend uh, uh, the likes of Free99, Lucas Sipo, um, Popbot, Emily.gg, I mean, the list's going to go on for a long time, but Maluk, um, I've been really into an artist called Kaifu recently. There's N2 Anti Real, there's um, uh, Glyph Lee, and yeah, there's, there's a lot. I'll send a lot of links afterwards. Oh, but please yes, do. I'll, I'll make sure that I put them in the description. <laughs> uh, have a look. These are, I'm quite fortunate to be. Um, in relatively close contact with a lot of the people that have inspired me. Um, so a lot of these people I've learned a lot directly from just because we met in these online communities that I was talking about at the start and um, just got in touch. And a bunch of us now are like very close friends, but they're all really incredible artists that have inspired me to no end and taught me to no end also. So yeah. I will definitely put some links to your music in the in the description as well. But it would be interesting okay. to hear, do you have future plans for releases? What would you like to do? Is there anything you haven't done yet? I want to make another album. Uh, wait, I'm just going to close my um, Ableton because my computer's starting to complain. Uh, I want to make another album, but I also want to try and start working with either a, a, a different 
style or maybe an entirely different genre. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm definitely not going to stop doing sort of glitchy and experimental things because that's just some of my favorite things to do. Um, but it's partly just sort of, I'm a bit tired of making the same stuff over and over again, because that's what I was doing while I was in uni. And so I'm trying to make a bunch of different things. I got pretty into um, dubstep recently. I'm not good at making it, <laughs> but the uh, the technical side of that genre and, and the sound design and the, the mixing and mastering, all, all of that stuff was really interesting and really impressive to me. And I learned a lot just from talking to people in those communities and just trying to make it myself. And I've been applying a lot of those things to um, the music that I make now, um, particularly my sound design. But um, in the meantime, I guess what I want to do is um, I want to release some sample packs because I've made a lot of samples and my friends enjoy using them. So I want to put them up publicly at some point, but I need to actually arrange them because at the moment they're a mess and my friends are willing to put up with that, but I don't think other people will. Um, and I want to try and find work in like sound design for games because um, that's, I need a job. <laughs> And uh, I, I want to find some work in, in music or uh, audio, and uh, I would like to do that because that's something I'm, I think I'm quite good at. Yeah, I yeah. know, oh, you definitely should. I mean, it sounds amazing, the stuff that you do. It's super talented. If there is anyone else that you think I should chat to in another interview, like who would you be curious to hear what they have to say? Do you have any? Are you looking specifically for people in the UK? No, it doesn't have to be in the UK. No. I think I would English, but <laughs> oh yeah, I would. I would recommend. Yeah, absolutely. I speak to people anywhere in the world. I I would recommend um, Wolg, and uh, uh, I would recommend Thorn, uh, who I will also link, and I would recommend Sunk mainly because they're all very sociable and very good at what they do, and I think they'd be fun to have in conversation. I'd also recommend um, Soup. Sorry, Soup. <laughs> um, I will I will link her too. But yeah, those are, those are the four names that I would recommend. They're all people that I met through uh, Glitch.cool. Three of them are actually just moderators from that server. Um, but yeah, they're very, very talented producers. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much. This has been super inspiring. And thank you for like really giving us an insight into like the stuff that you do and happy to share your projects and stuff and really looking forward to hear um, what you're going to do next and whatever album and genre you're going to make. So I think it's probably a good time to wrap up, but um, even though I'm going to stop this recording, stay on the call. You stay on the call. Uh, Will do. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much.